Hello, I am Ashante Green, and I would like to welcome you to Florida Climate Week 2021. Today's session is called Our Vulnerable Places, Jacksonville and Northeast Florida Underwater. This session is presented to you by Resilient Jacks in partnership with the Volo Foundation. So during this presentation, you will learn about Northeast Florida's most vulnerable places and assets in the face of climate change. We will discuss the infrastructure and policy solutions necessary to protect our frontline communities and make Northeast Florida more resilient. Let me introduce you to your speakers for today. First, you will hear from me, Ashante Green. I am the Outreach and Communications Coordinator with Resilient Jacks. Next, you'll hear from Sean Laha. He is the Resiliency Coordinator with Northeast Florida Regional Council. Then you'll hear from Guillermo Simon. He is the Director of Water Resources with HAF Associates. You'll also hear from Nancy Powell. She is the Executive Director of Scenic Jacksonville and she's also with the Riverfront Parks Now Coalition. You'll hear from John Sapora. He is the Disaster and Recovery and Resiliency Manager with List Jacksonville. He will also introduce us to Jerome Crawford. He is the Executive Director of Metro North Community Development Corporation. Last but not least, you will hear from Shannon Blankenship. She is currently the Advocacy Director of St. John's Riverkeeper. So I have the wonderful opportunity to let you all know about Resilient Jacks. So Resilient Jacks, it's a coalition of businesses, individuals, community groups, and organizations organized to assist the city's efforts in implementing a comprehensive strategy to build Jacksonville's resiliency and protect us from climate change. The mission of Resilient Jacks is to work collaboratively to propel equitable and proactive solutions that address the causes and the effects of climate change in Northeast Florida. We do this through advocacy, education, and community involvement. Why are we here today? We saw it very necessary to present this session to you because Jacksonville and Northeast Florida has frequently been identified as a national hotspot for negative impacts of climate change, despite us having one of the largest in that intact saltwater marshes on the East Coast, extensive damage from the three most recent hurricanes has showed Jacksonville to be very susceptible to flooding from rising seas, storm surges, and intense rainfall events. Resilient Jacks, we believe that these efforts for resiliency, they need to be transparent, equitable, and inclusive to all stakeholders and affected communities. So now I'll go ahead and pass it off to Sean Lahoff. He's gonna be our first speaker today. Sean, take us away. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for having me. My name is Sean Lahav, and I serve as Resiliency Coordinator for the Northeast Florida Regional Council. I am also a PhD student in the Urban and Regional Planning Department at Florida State University. The focus of my brief presentation today is on understanding Northeast Florida's vulnerabilities to the coastal hazards of flooding and sea level rise. With that, we're going to get started. On an introductory note, the Northeast Florida Regional Council is one of 10 regional planning councils in the state of Florida. Our regional council serves seven counties and 26 municipalities across the region. Our domains cover planning and policy, emergency preparedness, healthcare preparedness, economic development, and what we're here to talk about today, resiliency. In order to establish context for this presentation, I'd like to begin by stating that Northeast Florida is one of the most vulnerable areas in the United States to the coastal hazards of flooding, storm surge, and sea level rise. With thousands of miles of shoreline on the Atlantic Ocean, Intracoastal Waterway, and St. John's River, the region faces unique challenges, both in the short term dealing with storm events and the long term dealing with sea level rise. Northeast Florida also has a high concentration of military facilities, hospitals, and medical centers, 
and natural wetlands that are extremely vulnerable to these hazards. Despite the many threats facing the region, local governments and partner organizations across the region have taken proactive steps to build a more resilient future. To give you an example of some of these efforts, I would like to highlight some of them here. The Northeast Florida Regional Council Resiliency Program has been engaged in these issues for the better part of the past decade. Most recently through CARES Act funding at the federal level, we established the Northeast Florida Economic Resilience Task Force to identify short-term solutions for COVID-19 economic recovery, but moving into the long-term, identify solutions for issues such as climate change and sea level rise. County and municipal governments across the region have also been very proactive in addressing these issues. Jurisdictions have conducted coastal vulnerability assessments and studies. The city of Jacksonville recently concluded the Special Committee on Resiliency, and many jurisdictions have designated adaptation action areas all across the region. And then in other realms as well, there are a lot of studies underway and beyond the horizon. The US Army Corps of Engineers, for example, is currently conducting the South Atlantic Coastal Study where Northeast Florida is a focus area. And here we just have some highlights of recent activities that we have been involved with. An example is the final report that is, was produced for the, the Special Committee on Resiliency within the city of Jacksonville. And in the, in the middle, there is an example of all of the partner organizations that we have worked with at all levels in the United States to bring expert knowledge to the region. And on the right, there's a flyer for a Flagler County countywide approach to resilience planning where every municipality is coming together to adopt the same comprehensive plan language. Moving into the remainder of this presentation, I'd like to provide some imagery that highlights some of Northeast Florida's most vulnerable areas. In 2019, in partnership with Taylor Engineering in Jacksonville, Florida, we developed an online exposure mapping tool that allows users to look at different coastal hazards across the region. You can see the link below. From a baseline perspective, when we're working with property owners, whether it be in residential or commercial real estate, an important factor to take into consideration is whether you are located in a flood zone or not. So one of the layers provided in the tool here shows Jacksonville Beach and a neighborhood that is particularly vulnerable in terms of flood zones. And so if you're a property owner, this is a very baseline critical assessment that you should take into consideration. Beyond flood insurance zones, there's also storm surge, and this is a component related to storm events from past decades. And so what makes Northeast Florida unique compared to other regions across the state is our very expansive riverine and tributary systems. If you go up the state coming from Miami all the way to Northeast Florida, once you hit Duval County and Nassau County, tributaries start expanding all over the place, making inland communities vulnerable as well. And in St. Augustine, our nation's oldest city, we can see based on a hundred year flood event where flooding would occur and at what depth it would occur across the city. And St. Augustine is extremely vulnerable as well as the Davis Shores neighborhood. And then looking beyond storm events into the long range, when we're considering threats such as sea level rise, I have an example here on the south bank of downtown Jacksonville in San Marco that shows the devastating effects that might be beyond the horizon if three feet of sea level rise were to occur moving into the future. This would drastically transform this entire area. We at the Northeast Florida Regional Council recognize that there are many components necessary to build a more resilient community. And this, is, this consists of partnerships, education events, self-sufficiency and engagement. I borrowed this graphic from the RAND Corporation. And moving into the remainder of the presentation, I would like to highlight some examples of vulnerabilities in other counties located across Northeast Florida beyond Jacksonville. And so down on the border of St. Johns County and Putnam County, we can see on the Intracoastal Waterway where there's a little tributary system that there are many vulnerable assets when we're looking at storm surge. These include wastewater treatment facilities, cemeteries, police stations, and fire stations. In the context of fire stations, for example, an essential critical facility, we have an example here in Palm Valley in St. Johns County of a fire station that would most likely be inundated during a category two storm event. When we combine the storm surge knowledge with sea level rise moving into the future, we can see if there were to be a two to three foot increase in sea level rise across the region, this entire area would be entirely transformed. And so one of the solutions on the table is to examine where these critical facilities are located, examine what can be done within a uh, capital improvements program and relocate this facility to higher ground. 
Additionally, social justice is a very vital component of this picture as well. And social justice encompasses elderly populations, minority populations, and low-income populations. And so down in Flagler Beach in Flagler County, we can see that this is a very densely elderly population. And there are also critical facilities within this vicinity that are vulnerable to sea level rise moving into the future, including a police station and a fire station. Within the context of a current study that is underway by the Mayport Naval Air Station, this is also a very relevant example. Here we have the Mayport Naval Air Station, one of the most prominent military bases in Northeast Florida, but we also have Mayport Village, which is a historically low income population. The only access point into Mayport Village is through A1A. If we turn on two feet of sea level rise moving into the future, there might be a complete loss of access to this community if nothing is done to prevent it. The Mayport Naval Air Station through a transportation resiliency study is currently looking at options for these roadways. And then moving into a few other realms as well, healthcare facilities are vitally important to Northeast Florida's resilience. And so here on the south bank of downtown Jacksonville, we have the Baptist Medical Center, a very prominent medical center. And moving into the future, if there were to be a two to three foot increase in sea level rise, this will pose grave consequences for this medical facility. This medical center is currently taking steps to build resilience into the facility. But additionally, there are other facilities located across Jacksonville and Northeast Florida that might not even be aware of their vulnerabilities because where they are located. Here with Hogan's Creek, based on a category three, four or five storm event, we can see that this hospital would be impacted by that storm event. Moving into the future, sea level rise might pose an additional threat because conditions would be exacerbated. And additionally, on the social justice perspective, we have to examine where low income and minority populations live and reside when we're looking at coastal hazards. And so here in downtown Jacksonville, there is a densely populated low income and minority area. And as we can tell based on storm surge data, this is also one of the most vulnerable communities in Northeast Florida. Finally, in closing out this presentation, I would also like to take this time to highlight the conservation perspective. Down in Putnam County near the city of Palatka, there is a natural wetland that acts as a buffer zone for the city. And so this is located on the St. John's River. When we turn on two feet of sea level rise, which is a very realistic scenario, we see that this natural wetland would actually absorb the impacts of sea level rise and protect the greater community. This shows the value and benefits that nat natural services can provide. Additionally, there was a study conducted in 2018 that identified resilience hubs across Northeast Florida, areas where there are ecosystem benefits and flood mitigation benefits. Here at the Timaquan Ecological and Historical Preserve, if we turn on a six foot increase in sea level rise, a doomsday scenario, what we can see from the data is that this entire wetland area would absorb those impacts. The lesson here is if we build and construct residential developments and shopping centers in this area, we would be losing out on those flood mitigation benefits. Moving forward into the future, the Northeast Florida Regional Council remains committed to supporting local governments in identifying vulnerabilities and developing a more robust understanding of how to deal with them. Through state and federal grant funding opportunities, there are many projects that are currently taking place and beyond the horizon that we're very excited about. COVID-19 especially though, has broadened the resiliency discussion in Northeast Florida to also include components related to economic resilience. The Northeast Florida Economic Resilience Task Force, which I mentioned earlier, is currently developing a COVID-19 economic recovery plan. But moving into the future, we're gonna to transition to also include issues related to flooding, sea level rise, and climate change. In closing this presentation, I would like to conclude with this graphic. We really have to be taking a holistic look at all of these issues. COVID-19 has taught us so many lessons on resilience, and now is a more important time than ever to address these issues from a multidisciplinary perspective. Climate change is beyond the horizon. It's happening right now. We need to take lessons from COVID and what we're doing to address climate impacts and look at it from a holistic angle. Thank you very much for having me today. Again, my name is Sean Lahav. If you have any questions, please contact me at slahav at nefrc.org. I really appreciate it. Now we're gonna pass it off to Guillermo. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. And thank you everybody for your time and your interest in our presentation. Um, 
In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be talking about uh, the shorelines of Northeast Florida and what we can do to protect them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about you know, what solutions exist out there when we talk about gray and green alternatives, their benefits, their cons, their pros. And, um, and you know, I'll throw in some, uh, some personal um, thoughts on the topic. And so just by way of a very quick introduction, my name is Guillermo Simon, and I work for Half Associates out of Jacksonville, Florida. I am the director of water resources. I have over 20 years of experience uh, in water resources and coastal engineering. Um, so we live in a very diverse environment in Northeast Florida. Um, Northeast Florida features a large and comprehensive coastal, estuarine, and riverine ecosystem. The region is home to an estuary that's over 100 miles long and a surface of 115 square miles. Uh, plus all the multiple um, tributaries that flow into it that are also affected by, um, by tides. Um, you know, the um, Northeast Florida also features large systems uh, of beaches and dunes, uh, inlets, coastal embayments that are home to unique aquatic and terrestrial uh, species. Um, this is the St. John's River for those who aren't familiar with it, um, the, the tidally influenced area is about 100 miles long, which is very unique. I don't know many environments that have that kind of um, uh, you know flat slope and, and influence uh, tidal influence. Um, and then we have a more traditional coastal environment that's basically beach, sandy beaches um, all along the eastern uh, coast. And, and I think you know, it was this unique geographic setting that caused historic flooding in downtown Jacksonville during Hurricane Irma a few, a few years ago. Um, you know, historically, we've been fearing in the Northeast uh, Florida region, we've been fearing a, a, a direct hit, you know, which was a storm coming approaching from, um, from the east, from the Atlantic Ocean. And that may still be uh, you know, a very bad case scenario. But a few years ago, Hurricane Irma came this direction, basically the center of the peninsula, and caused flooding that had never been recorded before. You know, historic flooding in downtown Jacksonville. Um, you know, those of us who live in Northeast Florida recognize how fortunate we are uh, to live, to work, to play in this environment. Our region's beaches, estuaries, our tributaries offer unique ecology areas of outdoor uh, recreation and a vast commercial activity. Our shorelines provide access to these resources. Um, so what is it when we talk about shoreline protection? I like to call it uh, instead, you know, overcoming the effects of, uh, or overcoming the effects of and adapting to a receding shoreline. Um, Notably, what causes shoreline change? Well, it's erosion and rising sea levels, among other things, but those are the main two. Now, erosion is something that we have dealt with for a long time. Um, rising sea levels, on the other hand, we have dealt with only marginally, you know, the gradual increase of sea levels uh, over the last century. But now we see that effect um, uh, definitely increasing. It's definitely accelerating. And we see that we need to take care of it um, sooner rather than later. So what do we mean when we talk about shoreline protection? Are we protecting that shoreline? Um, in some instances, you know, shoreline protection means keeping it on the same location. Um, that's why we fortify it. We make it stronger so that there's no forces that can move it. However, with sea level rise, uh, sea level rise in particular, um, we have to see this under a different perspective. Uh, rising seas represent a stressor um, on our infrastructure that may not have been foreseen uh, during its planning and design. So the term shoreline protection gives the idea that we need to shield. However, shorelines are those buffers that separate oceans, rivers, lakes, you know, the water bodies from the infrastructure and the land features. And shorelines themselves are also natural environments, some that are more complex than others. Um, clarifying whether we need to preserve, protect, or adapt the shoreline or the land features becomes relevant to reach our sustainability goals. 
That's why I call this approach shoreline change adaptation. In, in finding those solutions, we need to treat shorelines as their own environment as often as possible, and then apply holistic approaches that use the entire toolbox of green and gray solutions. One quick note, what does sea level change look like in Northeast Florida? Sea level has been rising for the last century or so at a pace of about one inch every 10 years. That is not insignificant, and yet it's about to, you know, projections indicate that it's about to accelerate. So it's not unreasonable to think, you know, a whole foot before the turn of the century. Um, green, excuse me, green and gray um, solutions. So this is a, a graphic that I borrowed from NOAA, and it just shows, you know, the range of, of gray or hardened, hardened structures uh, and green or softer techniques. Uh, so revetments, bulkheads, seawalls, um, they aim to hold a shoreline in place. They provide protection from waves and currents, but they do not allow a shoreline to adapt. Um, for example, if we talk about the beach. You know, research shows that beaches with sandy dunes have a better ability to restore themselves than those beaches without dunes. So also uh, bulkheads and revetments tend to protect the area immediately behind them. You know? So that area, the area that they are protecting, uh, but they may exacerbate erosion on, you know, all around it, you know, on either side and also even on the toe structure. <clears throat> Some examples of gray infrastructure, seawalls, bulkheads, revetments, breakwaters, embankments, groins, you know, many of these uh, are basically um, rubble mound type structures, you know, stones piled uh, in different shapes, in different um, alignments with respect to the coast. And so we give them different uh, connotations or different names. Um, the, the figure on the right is a good example of uh, some of the challenges that seawalls bring with themselves. You know, the seawall is there, has a move, provides good protection behind it, but it's already needed additional protection to prevent from scour. And we can see the, that beach has receded right next to it. This is in St. John's County, uh, by the way. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving. Talk about some of the benefits from green um, uh, solutions. Uh, natural solutions bring benefits that extend beyond their immediate location. Uh, natural features help absorb carbon. They assist in sediment management by trapping it and allowing vegetation growth. Um, they improve water quality. They develop habitats. And the natural environments also provide significant protection from waves and surge. And they tend to be more resilient than many gray alternatives. Uh, and again, I mean, this, this often depends on the environment. You know, if it's a high energy environment, sometimes, you know, not every green infrastructure solution um, is, is suitable. Uh, shoreline change uh, examples, uh, sorry, adaptation solution examples using green infrastructure. So I used the Army Corps of Engineers uh, Engineering with Nature Atlas published in 2018. And they classify the examples in their atlas as beaches and dunes, wetlands, islands, reefs, levee setbacks and floodplains, which basically means allowing for space for the uh, you know, a river to, to flood a, an area you know, where it was a natural floodplain. Um, I can think of, for example, the uh, Kissimmee River, the Kissimmee River Valley in Central Florida. Um, levy setbacks and floodways, the use of vegetation and natural materials, and uh, you know the enhancement of um, those areas where we have to use artificial in infrastructure or hard infrastructure. And we also need to consider things like retreat, you know, uh, property buyouts, for example, uh, floodable parks, uh, education, outreach, and community involvement are so critical so that we can involve the community, bring in their perspective, their ideas, their priorities, and for sure their buy-in. Our regulation may be important. I'm not suggesting that regulation is the end or the, the means to achieve uh, resiliency, but regulation and engineering, I don't think either one can do, um, can do the job. So we 
we try to strike a balance between the two. And then just to wrap up, I want to show you an example from the um, from a living shoreline here in Northeast Florida. This is in the uh, Guano Tolomaro Matanzas Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, those interested in living shorelines, I recommend you go to this website, floridalivingshorelines.com. So that's a free commercial for them. Um, and just as in closing, um, shoreline change adaptation requires evaluating each site's unique characteristics and using all the tools at our disposal. Uh, the combination of, of engineering, environment, and community input can help us reach social and economic interests and develop resilient communities. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And um, I'm going to um, thank you. And I'm going to pass it on to Nancy now. So thank you for having me here today. I'm so excited to talk about urban waterfront parks and resiliency. I'm one of the leaders of a coalition of 12 nonprofits in Jacksonville called Riverfront Parks Now. We have come together to advocate for a riverfront for all in our downtown, one that will allow for the riverfront to be accessed and enjoyed by all people, and that will contribute to protecting our city from future storms and sea level rise. Through a network of significant parks and green spaces along the waterfront, we can help address resiliency while providing so many other benefits to the community. First, I want to show you Met Memorial Park. It's a small riverfront park just south of our downtown in a historic neighborhood of Riverside. This is what happened in Hurricane Irma. And while the concrete balusters along the water are just now being restored four years later, the park returned to use shortly after the storm. Not so much for the apartment building next door. This is the Park Lane Apartments that was severely damaged and took a lot longer with much higher human and physical costs to get back to normal. Just north of here is a partial view of our downtown waterfront. So Irma was a wake up call for all of us here in Jacksonville because many of us thought it was only a beaches problem. Our coalition was born out of the desire to take a fresh look at our downtown Jacksonville with an eye towards resiliency and downtown revitalization. So in Jacksonville, our St. John's River runs right through the city and all agree that it is our biggest asset. But about 90% of the 1100 miles of shoreline is privately owned. Our downtown has also lagged many other cities in growth and vibrancy, not for lack of trying, but with less than optimal progress. In terms of flooding, there are two critical creeks that flow into the river, and those are targeted for restoration by a, a nonprofit called Je Groundworks Jacksonville, who is also creating a 30 mile trail system throughout the city neighborhoods. The restoration of these two creeks along with the trail system have huge positive potential implications for helping to address the flooding of areas where the, these creeks wind inland and also at the riverfront. So what we did is we looked at our downtown and what we saw was that there is a once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape a large part of our riverfront. Through a number of converging factors, we now have a group of city owned properties, all the colored uh, parcels here that you see that are publicly owned, vacant and unencumbered by legal contracts. So studying other cities, we quickly realized that riverfront parks and urban revitalizations go, go together hand in hand. And many of you in other cities already have these waterfront parks, but they can combine to amplify important benefits to the community. So more than being resilient, they can provide equitable access to citizens from all communities. They can provide social benefits of bringing people together and provide health and wellness benefits through outdoor recreation. They also provide positive economic impact through jobs by attracting people who also frequent businesses and spurring surrounding private development. So it's the combination of these benefits and the high level of design and engineering that can draw people to these parks. 
Parks that have been built within the last decade reflect the climate awareness and show a huge amount of creativity. I'm gonna step through some of the design features that have been implemented by cities in their design of waterfront parks to make the parks and the cities and the people more resilient. So in Nashville, you might never know visiting Cumberland Park that there is a cistern underneath that captures a million gallons of storm water. The park above provides a number of gathering places and features to bring people together in the beautiful setting along the river. Next door, there's another riverfront park that features geothermal energy beneath the green space, which you can see the design here on the left. And on the right, underneath this performance area, there's another 400,000 gallon water tank under the surface that collects storm water. Within two blocks of these parks, there has been over a billion dollars in economic investment. So it's a common pattern that great public spaces attract private investment. After Hurricane Sandy, New York realized that there was much to do to protect the shoreline. Hunter's Point here in Queens is an 11 acre model of urban ecology and sustainable thinking. Bulkheads along the water's edge were removed to make, nave, make way for new wetlands and pathways to create a softer edge. And the intersection of the city and the park is marked by richly planted bioswales. This 32 acre riverfront park in Cincinnati has it all. Everything is designed for function and beauty. There's a river walk, a labyrinth, artistically designed areas for kids and adults to play. And another view of it, you can see where there is a development built up and behind the road called the Banks. And it has also, it's behind additional green space with an arrangement that contributes to the park's maintenance. In this picture, you can see the designer, the park designer, Sasaki and Associates. The park was literally designed to flood and did flood <laughs> during the construction. But all of the features are designed so that when the, when the waters recede, the park is quickly put back into use. In Houston, the bayous used to be simply considered drainage dishes. Now they have brought it back to their natural state and opened up the area to recreation and miles of trails. It's also built knowing that nature will produce the flooding, but built so that electrical systems, for example, are above the flooding and return easily when the flooding subsides. So there is multifaceted, multiple infrastructure systems. It's a win-win when you approach things this way. Of course, some parks have structures along the river, and this is a performance boathouse in Tampa at their Julian B. Lane Park. And it's a, a waterfront craft area that allows Tampa to host regattas and, and boat uh, events, teaches people to kayak or paddleboard. And the roof of this structure you can see is slightly uh, sloped and it doubles for stormwater management, channeling the runoff into a lush rain garden that filters it through the landscape and plant material. Also, this space has become hugely popular as an event space due to its beauty and design. And it, so it generates revenue for the park. In St. Petersburg, the pier is a great example of a combination of gray and green infrastructure. There is certainly an ample amount of concrete on the pier, understandably, but they've also added a fishing area in the lower level um, with higher levels above it so that people can watch and view the bay. And then above that is a restaurant and bar that allows for wa waterfront dining and amazing views in the, of the city and the bay. The 26 acre pier park also features a natural beach, a wetlands area that you see here, and each area shows thoughtfully designed elements for potential flooding. Another key part of Resilient Parks is that there's an opportunity to showcase the features and teach people about climate change and adaptation strategies. So this segment of the Chicago Riverwalk is dedicated to floating wetlands and also as a place to do such education. In St. Pete, they have a discovery center in the middle of their pier for 
that has programs to learn about the Bay. And in Jacksonville, our Museum of Science and History does such education and they are planning a new riverfront home on the North Bank to help with that effort. So connectivity through creeks, linear parks, walking paths, bike trails, add to the recreational value and the economic impact as businesses locate around parks and trails. In Jacksonville, the Emerald Trail will allow for more equitable access to our riverfront as most of the trail system goes through parts of town that have been historically uh, had less investment, but it will bring people down to the riverfront. So here's a slight view of part of our riverfront. We have 75 acres of city owned land. The property on the right is Metropolitan Park. It's been a neglected 23 acre park. Um, and part of this is being considered for development of a hotel and a hospital. On the left is the adjacent 50 acre former shipyards property that has been vacant for 30 years, but it's the subject of more than three failed development efforts in the past and possibly it is being considered for more development. Um, although it's our goal to make much of both of these properties parkland. So we see the opportunity to create a resilient, healthy environment with an abundance of trees and shade to lower the heat index and make our cities more livable and healthier. Clearly parks provide so many benefits, resilience, equitable, social, healthy, economically vibrant. And what we are doing is we are building a community of support for this goal and advocating to our city leaders that it's time to be stewards of our land and invest in our public waterfront. This means not only planning for sea level rise and climate change, but making our waterfront access equitable and a place to bring our community together, demonstrating that well-designed public space is a good business investment in the future. You can reach me at nancy at scenicjacks.org or visit our website, riverfrontparksnow.org. Thank you. And now I'm gonna uh, pass this along to John Sapora from LISC. All right, good afternoon. My name is John Sapora. I am the Disaster Recovery and Resiliency Manager at LISC Jacksonville. And I'm also the uh, founding chair of the Duval uh, Community Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma, uh, community service organizations, government agencies, and the business community established a long-term recovery organization like uh, occurred around the state of Florida that provided a variety of services and financial assistance and support of government relief efforts. And what, what remains of our LTRO work uh, is the last of three home repair programs. And so this video um, gives a flavor of our LTRO work and how it focuses uh, on our community residents uh, who are least financially able to recover. It's my childhood home. It's somewhere that I love. It's somewhere that I'm comfortable at. It's somewhere where I can walk out my door and I know my neighbors and they know me. Family meals, family gatherings, my mom and my dad. It's like one of the only places that I know is home. The hallway bathroom we don't use because of the ceiling. It's really bad. It's moldy. The ceiling is like a big bubble, like it's been holding water for basically two to three years now. And then sometimes the water trickles down through like the cracks like that right there, or comes through there, like the vent up here. Some of the appliances don't work because of when the house got struck by lightning. Just the water damage all in itself, you're unable to really store food in the cabinets. You have to store them in other places. We use window units basically that probably won't cool the whole house and portable heaters to whatever room we're in in the moment, basically. Because you can't have too many heaters going at once. You might cause a fire. This is uh, unlike anything that people have seen for a long time. This morning, Jacksonville is seeing the worst flooding in nearly a century. 
There was a lot of mistrust at the very beginning. We were doing the needs assessment work. We would knock on doors of people's homes and say, we're here to help you. They wouldn't even answer the door. First and foremost, I think we gave people hope. Well, imagine having a leaky roof for over two years and the water has damaged your ceilings or walls in your home. And so it's really important that these families, for health reasons and for their emotional and spiritual welfare, that they are assisted by the long-term recovery organization. For me, it's been a labor of love. As a startup two years ago, we came together 30 organizations or more, trying to understand how we can effectively work together in helping families in our community impacted by Hurricane Irma. Sometimes it comes down to paying for medicine, paying bills, and getting a roof fixed. The bill and the medicine wins out. The tree fell on my rooftop, on the, back, on the, on the tail end back there, on the, and it, it, it put holes in my, my, my shingle up there. Oh, well, it affected the whole house. The rain came in. Oh my God, it was in there like a river. I had carpet on the floor and everything. I had to take all that out, and that mold and that mildew affects your, your system inside. And I, I would like to clean that up as much as I can, as fast as I can. Because we're all going to die one day, but we don't want to be dying because of lack of help, and lack of we can get some kind of help somewhere. I would say the heart of the program is our community development corporations who serve as construction managers and the contractors that they use who are neighborhood contractors. And this is more than a home repair program for them. This is about serving the families and they care for the families. They're sensitive to the trauma that these families have gone through. And it's, it's just an, an amazing experience for us to serve these families through this program. In some of these cases, new construction is going on around these homes that are being rehabbed or being repaired. So they got to stay in step with the new construction and keep their values up by keeping repairs done and keeping maintenance going. So for us, that's what we look at as well in the overall scheme. It's another arm, or another extension to what we do. And it's a very important one because it keeps the homes that cannot afford to get a big makeover to get those main repairs done, like the MEP, the mechanical, the electrical, the plumbing, and the roofs. I thank you all for trying to come and help me out. You know, it's a blessing too. And I ain't think nobody around here cares, <laughs> but I think you all care. I know you all care. The Long-Term Recovery Organization has a committee system where we have checks and balances, a case management committee, a construction committee, our executive committee serves as the Unmet Needs Roundtable. So we really do vet these cases through a process. Our contractors obtain competitive bids for each of the home repairs. So that's an opportunity for local businesses to participate. And so it's a good system that we've developed with over 50 homes repaired so far. These homeowners need assistance and for us to secure a home for them to live in safely and comfortably will help their family life, will help them with their job stability, will help their children attend the same school that they have been going to. So it really is securing homes with new roofs that will also secure them for the next storm. That would be the best thing in the world. It will be like a weight lifted off of everybody, not just me, because I, even though they're kids, I know they notice that things aren't working properly. And even when, if I'm depressed about certain things, they're depressed because they don't really understand what's going on and why. So it's important to have programs such as the LTRO and what we're doing to keep those homes viable, to keep them relevant, and to make sure that they get repairs, although they may be 50, 60 years old in some cases, but they're just as important, they're just as valuable, and the lives that live in them, they, they mean just as much. These families are very grateful for the home repairs. They are so appreciative of the caring and concern from the community, and they realize that they're not forgotten.
Um, one of the favorite parts of my work is to get to know some of the homeowners and, and to work with, uh, with uh, wonderful people who, who are neighborhood leaders uh, in, in this disaster recovery uh, and preparation work. Um, uh, I wanted to point out that, that uh, uh, at the government level, FEMA uh, uh, talks about a whole community approach. And I think our, our long-term recovery organization uh, is an example uh, where, where it, it's not just about government assistance uh, after a disaster. Um, it's, it's really fundamental to have uh, local uh, 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 charities and, and community-based organizations. Um, even the millions of dollars of federal and state money that might come into your community are not enough to address all the unmet needs. And I think that's a very important point uh, with disasters. Um, uh, some of the research shows that, that um, the more uh, federal funding comes into a community, the wider uh, the wealth gap is in those communities. So, so there's a lot of money, but the, but the opportunity is to make sure we allocate those resources to address unmet needs. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, one of my favorite people, uh, Jerome Crawford, who is the executive director of the Metro North Community Development Corporation. He's vice chair of our, of our disaster coalition, and he's also um, a construction manager for the home repair program. Uh, so Jerome, I'd, I'd just like to ask, uh, with your many years of working in neighborhood-based organizations, what are some of the challenge, challenges that residents face and how do storm damage affect their lives? Well, hi, John, good to see you. I'm Jerome Crawford. Uh, Executive Director of Metro North CDC. Um, that's a very good question, John. Uh, if we go back to the basics, one of the challenges we have is that a lot of the families that we serve are low-income families. And what that really comes out to is that they do not have the means to maintain homes. Um, even though we go on to mitigate storm damage, when we get there, there's a lot of pre-existing damage that's there that really kind of compounds our efforts. Uh, a lot of homeowners we go into, uh, again, don't have the income level to maintain roofs. Sometimes we see air conditioners not working, heat not working, uh, various type of uh, mold and mildew issues. So it's really a challenge. Um, and as John said earlier, even though we may get you know, multi-millions of dollars coming into neighborhoods, there's really a systemic issue going on that homeowners are not able to maintain their home to begin with. Uh, so we go in the best we can and we're able to uh, mitigate some of the things that relate to storm damage. But when we leave, sometimes there's still damage remaining because uh, there is pre-existing damage prior to the storm. With, with uh, Hurricane Irma, it seemed like flooding was not as much of an issue. It was, it was really wind damage and rain so that the roofs that weren't uh, well maintained, those would leak. So we, uh, a lot of our home repairs have to do with uh, re-roofing a home, which, which is a resiliency opportunity for this homeowner. How, how do some of our home repairs actually promote uh, uh, a resiliency for these homeowners in these lower income neighborhoods? That's a good point, John. Uh, most of our efforts have been, probably 90% of our work has been to uh, put on re-roofs because uh, oftentimes wind come in, a lot of shingles come off, trees are blowing down, holes are uh, put in roofs. And now you have not only just a roof issue, but I may have mill and mold, do, uh, mold and mildew issues. We may have ceilings and walls that need to be stripped out and repaired and replaced. And so a lot of our work is from the roof damage, mitigating all the supplemented damage that result of the roof being a problem. Uh, uh, explain a little bit about how a community organization, a community development corporation and other neighborhood organizations, what their role might be in, in, in uh, communicating uh, the needs from those neighborhoods uh, with respect to resiliency and infrastructure and that would relate to maybe flood control and issues like that that are in the neighborhood? 
Okay, as a community development organization, we're really charged with working with the community as a whole to mitigate not only the hurricane issues, but other issues. It could be um, clogged storm drains in neighborhoods that are now, if they are already clogged up, a storm occurs, now I have additional flooding. So we're working with neighborhoods to begin, um, I guess, some of the mitigation issues prior to any storms, helping with uh, storm drains being cleaned, um, keeping neighborhoods clean, um, keeping the streets clean so we can have um, uh, a good path for um, excavation. We have to actually move out of the neighborhood. Um, then there are other things we do with homeowners. We try to help them understand again, prior to storms, you know, how do you prepare? Uh, let's look at windows, let's look at doors, let's look at weather stripping and those types of things and other issues in the home. If we can secure the home prior to a storm, that means we have better chance of surviving the storm without a lot of major damage. Yes. Well, thanks, Jerome. Do many of these homeowners actually have insurance uh, either, either for casualty or for flood insurance? Uh, that's a very good question, John. A lot of our homeowners, again, do not have homeowners insurance, uh, especially in the older stock of homes where there may not be a mortgage on the home. So if there's no mortgage, there is really no requirement for the homeowner to have home insurance. Um, there's no uh, push, if you will. So oftentimes, again, in a low-income, low-income family, that's probably one of the things that's not going to be paid because it's not a priority anymore. Uh, more of the basic needs like uh, fuel and food and clothing are now the priority. So repairs, homeowners insurance, definitely flood insurance are things that are probably non-existent. So a lot of our situations we come in, the homeowner can't even call insurance claim in to even repair the roof. So now you have a situation where I have a hole in the roof, have no insurance to repair it. The best thing I can do now is put a top on my home and hope that the top survives years because a lot of clients, again, are going to be stuck with that roof issue for years to come. All right. Thanks, Jerome. Uh, we really appreciate your work. and. And, you know, it's almost four years later from Hurricane Irma, and, and there are still unmet needs in the community. So, um, so thank you for your service. Um, thank you, John. Uh, uh, Shannon, why don't you show the disaster cycle slide, and, and, and I want to talk just a minute about uh, the real um, close connection between uh, uh, these uh, traditional disaster services, uh, working with emergency management, uh, and, and climate resiliency. I think it's so important to realize that in this disaster management cycle, uh, uh, we talk a lot about preparation, education, uh, mitigation, adaptation. So that's really where the, the resiliency movement is as well. We want to um, uh, reduce the impacts. Of, uh, we want to assess hazards and reduce the impacts of, of storm disasters and, and, and climate change. Um, so I think there's a real alignment there with uh, traditional disaster services. Um, and also, I would encourage people to get involved with um, a disaster services work in their community because it is very holistically uh, based uh, as far as working with government and, and businesses as well. Uh, but also, when you work on the front lines with uh, disaster recovery, you see what those, those issues are in neighborhoods all across your community, very different neighborhoods. So I think that's really important to inform um, the solutions um, in the resiliency movement. And then finally, what I've realized is that there's a lot of funding. If I put my uh, disaster services hat on, there's, there's a tremendous amount of funding that comes through FEMA and HUD and other agencies uh, that, that, that look only like their disaster recover funding, but a lot of it is also um, very helpful for the resiliency movement. And, and a good example is the Groundwork Jacksonville uh, Emerald Trail um, that was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, HUD CDBG uh, mitigation funding uh, was, uh, was awarded to Groundwork Jacksonville about $720,000 uh, for a watershed uh, planning effort with Hogan's Creek um, in 
in downtown Jacksonville. So it's a great example of out of the disaster recovery money, um, there can also be money for resiliency. Uh, so in closing, I'd like to say we invite everyone uh, uh, in, in the climate resiliency uh, effort uh, to get engaged in, in, in disaster services because I think we can really align well together and learn from one another. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for sticking around. My name is Shannon Blankenship. I'm the Advocacy Director at St. John's Riverkeeper, and I'm going to try and uh, bring us all home here with some final messages and some uh, some some words of, of moving forward and looking to the future with all that we've learned today. So Sean Lahav did a great job of explaining in Northeast Florida where our vulnerable and critical facilities are. Um, uh, Guillermo Simon showed us what kinds of structural and infrastructure solutions are, um, uh, uh, are being looked at right now and will be appropriate as we move into the future. Nancy Powell showed us that parks are resiliency and in fact, um, parks are solutions that uh, protect all of us uh, in the community. And then Jerome and John, I thought did a great job of showing us that you know when it comes to being impacted by storms, it isn't a one-time, you know, uh, impact, but it, it can impact and alter entire communities with um, uh, that have long-term needs, and there are long-term uh, solutions that that need to be addressed to to really try to you know understand and prevent. Um, uh, communities from being impacted uh, this way. Um, I do want to uh, though sort of remind everyone of why Northeast Florida is so um, uh, moving in the resiliency spectrum here. And it's because Hurricane Irma that happened in 2017 was a hurricane that moved up from South Florida all the way through Central Florida and the St. Johns River flows north. And so as it moved up through South Florida, it started moving water from our headwaters in Indian River and Brevard County up through Central Florida where it culminated and met with the uh, Atlantic Ocean and really impacted the downtown Jacksonville area and inland waterways, um, even more so than many of our coastal communities. Uh, Hurricane Irma in 2017 was only a category one tropical storm when, uh, when it, it impacted our downtown, but it brought a category three storm surge. And we know that the future of storms are predicted to be more frequent. They are predicted to last longer and that there will be more precipitation coming from future storms than storms in the past. And so knowing that that is our future and knowing what Hurricane Irma did to the city of Jacksonville, at St. John's Riverkeeper, we asked ourselves, are we more prepared one year later in 2018 than we were before Hurricane Irma? You know, or more specifically, is there anything that we've learned? Are there any changes that we've made that would lead to us not having a Hurricane Irma hit us again every single year um, uh, based on you know, uh, infrastructure and resiliency solutions that we know exist and that other cities are taking, but that we ourselves maybe have not taken as well. So St. John's Riverkeeper launched a series of town halls in more than a dozen town halls that in, uh, within Duval, St. John's and Clay counties, over 1,000 people turned out to share with us their impact from Hurricane Irma, their continued impact, and their, their trepidation, their concerns about the future of storms and what they wanted to see from city leadership. 900 postcards were sent to city leaders, over 220 petition signatures asked that the city of Jacksonville demand more mitigation if they were to approve deepening the St. Johns River. And we also emphasize that, that any solution uh, will require statewide collaboration. No municipality alone uh, can solve the critical issues that we see right now. Um, this, the, the town halls asked essentially for three things. 
We wanted to see the city of Jacksonville hire a chief resiliency officer to break away from the fact that for years we've had a siloed approach to dealing with resiliency issues. There's a lot going on in planning. There's other things going on in parks. There's other things happening in emergency planning and preparedness. There's a whole nother thing happening at our regional council and then even uh, you know different actions on public works. And so where is the cohesion and everyone coming together to move forward in an efficient and cohesive plan? We wanted to see a vulnerability assessment to really understand what communities are the most at risk, what structures are the most at risk and what's the plan for protecting protecting those critical facilities and communities in the face of sea level rise. And, and last, we wanted to see mitigation for the impact of dredging the St. John's River from 40 to 47 feet, which we knew would immediately exacerbate already projected sea level rise. Now, that was 2018, one year after Hurricane Irma. In 2019, we started to see a response from the city to this essentially in action. And one of the first things that the city did was they launched the Storm, Storm Resiliency and Infrastructure Development Review Committee. And what this committee did and what this committee was charged with was looking at the uh, uh, ordinance code changes and the the um, really quick sort of um, development code uh, uh, alterations that could be made that would um, immediately have an impact on development when it came to drainage and flooding issues and concerns. One of the places that I would recommend anyone who wants to follow up on this is to look at the news coverage from the um, WJCT's ADAPT series. They went to every single meeting and have incredible synopsis of uh, the sort of complex and nuanced development solutions that were um, proposed and many of them passed. This was a lot of quick legislation that happened to address flooding and drainage concerns, but still quite a micro focus when you think about it in terms of what's happening in Jacksonville and what needs to happen with resiliency. The next um, sort of big undertaking that occurred was the Adaptation Action Area Working Group. And this was, again, um, uh, nearly a year long process. Uh, uh, community stakeholders came together and asked themselves, what does two foot of sea level rise by 2060 mean for planning moving forward? And the top priorities that came out of this task force were, again, to echo you know, previous uh, needs identified, a chief resiliency officer, right, to really take what uh, was a very comprehensive uh, report, a very comprehensive list of, of recommendations that were made, someone needs to be a champion for them in order to see them happen. Second, vulnerability assessments. And at this point, I will differentiate. There may be vulnerability assessments that look at at-risk communities, different assessments that look at critical infrastructure, and in fact, different in, uh, uh, assessments uh, for example, JEA has done an extensive and um, uh, very impressive look at their own critical infrastructure and how they need to be resilient in the face of very, you know, a, a, a slew of different sea level rise projections combined with storm impacts and really looking at compound events like Irma and how that will impact their infrastructure moving forward. The last thing is that there needs to be um, an expansion of the adaptation action area boundaries. And I have a, um, a map right here of Duval County specifically in terms of that expanded boundary. Um, I have a zoom in that I'll show you on the next slide, but what this is basically, this expanded boundary is saying that um, uh, essentially our adaptation action area was looking at when the sea level rise comes in, how is that going to impact us? But Jacksonville, keep in mind, is inland, okay? So sea level rise alone, it will go up river, but it doesn't necessarily impact inland waterways. But that's not what we've been seeing from storms. In fact, what we've been seeing from storms echoes much more of storm surge um, closely related to storm surge level two and three. That's what we saw in Hurricane Irma was a category three storm surge. And so um, uh, the 
the maps that were identified actually are closer to or, or echo and um, what a category three storm surge looks like for our downtown communities. And this is a look at the zoomed in um, purview of the expanded adaptation action area boundaries for our downtown area. Now I know that Sean in the earlier slides showed you downtown Jacksonville and the very vulnerable areas that exist with much more detail than this. But the reason that this is important is, you know, to date when we looked at the um, planning and uh, development on our coastal areas, the impact of sea level rise has been fairly minimal because as Jacksonville is really far inland, the impact of sea level rise and, and coastal storms hasn't necessarily restricted a lot of development. And the expanded adaptation action area is a much more realistic future look at what we can expect and where development may need to be elevated or where additional enhancements and protections may need to go. One area to, to also highlight on this map here is that the entire Metropolitan Park and Shipyards area that uh, Nancy mentioned in her presentation um, is underwater. And so having that park um, be a resilient feature would help to protect our downtown area um, rather than uh, uh, thinking about high density development in that um, particular area. The third committee that happened following the outcome of the adaptation action area was a special committee on resiliency. And uh, the special committee on resiliency broke into three subcommittees looking at infrastructure, education, environmental planning. Yes, there was a lot of overlap with what had just been discussed in the adaptation action area, but it was meant to take some of that work and move it forward. There were more than 40 subject matter experts that met for more than 50 meetings. And, and one of the outcomes was that the Special Committee on Resiliency identified that the city of Jacksonville needs a chief resiliency officer in order to take some of the uh, uh, very important strategic and, and critical needs to uh, uh, move Jacksonville into becoming a more resilient city um, and really own that and, and ensure that we're moving in that direction. And so um, the Special Committee on Resiliency actually authored a bill set aside the funding and then um, appropriated uh, the uh, uh, the budget to to um, to hire a chief resiliency officer. Uh, we also published a final report, which you can see here, and Sean Lahav mentioned in his presentation, which has um, unfortunately lots and lots of things that the city of Jacksonville needs to do to become more resilient. Um, and at this point, it does seem like it is being um, uh, the marching orders of the chief resiliency officer. The job posting uh, has been active on the city of Jacksonville's website for about three months now. Uh, the job description just closed. And so the chief resiliency officer will probably be charged with taking the recommendations and the policy outcomes of that special committee report and trying to put some of it in action. Now, um, I just wanna highlight with this that that if you think at all that, you know, Hurricane Irma impacting us in 2017 and the fact that we have gotten to 2021 and we have yet to hire a chief resiliency officer, we have yet to expand those adaptation action area boundaries, um, and we have yet to put in uh, place some uh, really, um, uh, you know, strong development restrictions in areas that we know will, um, uh, you know, flood uh, in the uh, current time, as well as the near future, and of course, future future, then you're correct. We've really been dragging our feet with some of these um, uh, important initiatives. And so while there is a lot that we can report on that's coming out of Northeast Florida in terms of policy objectives and targets moving forward. Um, I, I don't think that it's you know out of line to say that we are behind the curve from every other major city in the state of Florida. And even though we have tremendous momentum from the community and tremendous momentum from um, uh, the uh, many of our, our city council members and, and leadership, um, that doesn't necessarily translate into quick action and, and prioritized action from 
from um, the leadership that really could make resiliency a top priority for the city of Jacksonville um, pending, you know, uh, um, being, uh, you know, two months away from the 2021 hurricane season. So with that, I want to end with, you know, a call to action to, uh, to become a member of Resilient Jacks. Uh, Resilient Jacks essentially formed during the Special Committee on Resiliency's uh, 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 meeting and, and um, time that they were forming as a grassroots and coalition based organization looking to support and enhance the important recommendations that were being made to the Special Committee on Resiliency. And, and again, I'll just sort of um, end here today by saying that resiliency is extremely popular in the city of Jacksonville. There is tremendous community support for um, having a more resilient city, for improving our infrastructure, for enhancing our parks, for making our most vulnerable communities not to have to suffer the impacts of disasters and storms that they have continued to suffer um, uh, year in and, and year out, um, as well as for all of us to have more of a sense of security as we see a future of more storms, wetter storms, lasting longer and happening more frequently, that our city is um, uh, enabled to, um, to protect us and, and that we can feel safe and secure. And so uh, Resilient Jacks is a place for um, trying to bring as many of those voices into one, uh, into one uh, space so that we can have a loud voice um, and, and be heard when it comes to making important decisions for the city of Jacksonville and for Northeast Florida, um, because the city of Jacksonville is a leader for all of Northeast Florida. And so I hope that you will consider joining and becoming a member no matter where you are of Resilient Jacks today. I want to thank all of our panelists for being a part of this um, presentation today and everyone for tuning in and joining us. And with that, I will say um, thank you and have a great rest of your day.